This evening's reading is from Exodus chapter 18, verses 1 to 27, starting on page 75 of your Pew Bibles. Exodus 18, starting at verse 1, from page 75. <coughs> now Jethro, the priest of Midian, and father-in-law of Moses, heard of everything God had done for Moses and for his people Israel, and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. After Moses had sent away his wife, Zipporah, his father-in-law Jethro received her and her two sons. One son was named Gershon, for Moses said, I have become an alien in a foreign land. And the other was named Eleazar, for, for he said, My father's God was my helper. He saved me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, together with Moses' sons and wife, came to him in the desert, where he was camped near the mountain of God. Jethro had sent word to him, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. They greeted each other and then went into the tent. Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. For Israel's sake, and about all the hardships they had met along the way, and how the Lord had saved them. Jethro was delighted to hear about all the good things the Lord had done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. He said, Praise be to the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh, and who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods. For he did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and other sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning till evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, What is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, Because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a, dis a dispute, it is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and laws. Moses' father-in-law replied, what you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice, and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them the decrees and laws, and show them the way to live and the duties they are to perform. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you, the simple cases they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter, because they will share it with you. If you do this, and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain, and all these people will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They served as judges for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided themselves. Then Moses sent his father-in-law on his way, and Jethro returned to his own country. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good evening. Please do keep the Bible open there. We're mostly on page 76. 
in Exodus chapter 18, and I'm going to pray as we come to this word together. Lord God, this is indeed your word, and we do give you thanks for it. We thank you that we're able to read it now as your people gathered together. And we pray that you would be speaking to each one of us and be at work in our lives and build us up together as your people to give you glory. We pray this in the name of our precious Saviour, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Now Exodus chapter 18 is something of a bridge between two main parts of Exodus. It follows the account of God's great rescue of his people from Egypt, and indeed the the first half of the chapter is all about delighting in that. And then the second half of the chapter somewhat anticipates uh, the next main section that's about to come, uh, with the giving of the law on Mount Sinai and all the dramatic events which surrounded that. And in some ways, it would be a bit tempting to kind of gloss over this chapter a bit. And if you were making a film about Exodus, you might just cut uh, Exodus 18 and move on because the next bit looks more exciting. Uh, I mean, as you scan through Exodus 18, yes, it's nice. It is nice, isn't it? there's, There's a family reunion and they have a nice meal. And there's probably a lesson in there about accepting good advice and management techniques and so on. But you know, let's cut that bit out and move on because it gets more exciting in the next chapter. Sometimes I think we, we may do similar things in our lives as Christians if we're always looking for the next big exciting thing and feeling twitchy when everything's just ordinary. So maybe you remember uh, being converted Maybe that's a, a, you can point to a day and say that's when that happened. It was very exciting. Or the last time you really felt God using you powerfully in your life. And it was really exciting. And when's the next time like that going to come along? It's just ordinary and boring. Chapter 18 of Exodus is one of those very helpful chapters in the Bible that sits in between big and exciting things. And as those chapters tend to do, shows you something of what life ordinarily is like as a believer and when you look at those sorts of chapters and you look closely do you know what happens you tend to get excited about them that's what happened for me as I was looking at Exodus 18 this week and you realize what wonderful things God is doing ordinarily in the lives of believers so two things I think we see going on here It will help us to think about life as believers in between the dramatic and the sensational. We see God's salvation celebrated. We see God's people learning God's ways. That is basically what we do day to day as Christians. Celebrate God's salvation and seek to live his ways. Firstly then, God's salvation celebrated. And this is the first 12 verses of this chapter. Here we have Jethro return to the narrative. I don't know about, there's something about that name. I always think I would have liked Jethro if I'd met him. It's, I don't know why. But here we have Jethro. We've seen him before. Back in chapter 2, when Moses had fled from Egypt, he'd ended up staying with Jethro. And as we're told again here, Jethro was the priest of Midian. That means he wasn't one of God's people being a Midianite. And he was a priest of Midian, so he was a priest in some false religion. And we read that Moses had married his daughter, Zipporah. And then years later, after the whole thing with the burning bush, Moses had returned to Egypt uh, with Zipporah, his wife, and his sons who had been born. And that's where we waved goodbye to Jethro. But here we see him again. And I don't know whether Jethro had been converted before this passage or whether these verses maybe are the story of him being converted. Some people think they are. Others aren't so sure. I think I fall into the category of being not so sure. It might just be that he deepens in his understanding significantly, moves on in his faith. 
Either way, I think the, the focus in these first 12 verses here is more on the general fact of God being made known and his acts of salvation being celebrated all for his glory. Let me show you that. It, it, it happens in the, in the events that, that are recorded, but also in the way that they are recorded. Let's have a look. Verse 1. We're told that Jethro in Midian had heard, and get used to phrases like this, of everything God had done for Moses and for his people Israel, and how Yahweh had brought Israel out of Egypt. He'd heard about that. That's not a surprise, is it, when you consider what's happened? All the plagues, the Passover, the crossing of the Red Sea. It's not a surprise that words of that spread about a bit. And Jethro has heard it. This salvation of God, uh, of God's people, is for God's glory. God's fame is growing. Next, we get details about Moses' family and the names of his sons. And the way that's brought in here is just adding to that picture of remembering and celebrating God's salvation. Now, it says in verse 2 that at some point Moses had sent Zipporah and his sons away. We're not sure when he did that exactly. It hadn't said uh, in the narrative. It may simply have been that having recently crossed the Red Sea and being more in the neighborhood, uh, Moses thought maybe the, the, the children would like a visit to Grandpa Jethro. I don't know. Anyway, they, they'd been off to see Jethro, and Jethro is bringing them back. And we're told the names of Moses' sons, verse 3. Very deliberately put in here. We've heard about one of them before, in chapter 2, when Moses had fled from Egypt, and he'd ended up as a stranger in a foreign land. He'd named his son Gershom, which in Hebrew sounds like stranger there, because Moses had said, I have become an alien, a stranger, a foreigner in a foreign land. We haven't yet heard the name of the second son, but we hear it here, Eliezer which means God is my help, because Moses had said when he was born, my father's God was my helper. And we're told these two names again here, because it's just through these details, just in the way it's recorded, we're just being reminded, see how far we've come. Moses was in exile, a stranger in a foreign land. Look where he is now, after God had helped him having led God's people out of Egypt in the most amazing way. So too for Israel. You could look at it more widely. Look how far Israel has come, the people of God. They were oppressed in a foreign land. And now God, their helper, has rescued them from the sword of Pharaoh. It all adds to the sense of the salvation of God, the salvation acts of God being remembered and celebrated. And that sense grows in the events that are actually recorded here. Moses goes out to greet Jethro, and they go into the tent. And what do they talk about? Verse 8. Everything Yahweh had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake. And all the hardships they had met along the way, and how Yahweh had saved them. They're celebrating God's salvation. They're rehearsing the details of it. It's not just in summary. It's not, hey, Moses, great that you're saved. And Moses says, yeah, it's great that we saved. Oh, gosh, Liverpool lost this week. It's, it's not that at all. They go into details. Moses tells him everything that the Lord had done. This happened, and this, and this, and then God did this, and then we met this hardship. Oh, and God rescued us this way. And Jethro's heard it before, as it says in verse 1. He's heard it before, but he is delighted to hear it again. Verse 9, he's delighted to hear about what? All the good things Yahweh had done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. And then he praises the Lord. Why does he praise the Lord? Well, let's just say it again, verse 10. He rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh and he rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. And then he declares, verse 11, Now I know 
Yahweh is greater than all other gods. And that's where some people think, well, that, that might indicate he's just been converted. Um, it, it may simply mean he's, he's deepened in his conviction and really come on. I don't know. In any case, it's an entirely re appropriate response to rehearse the story of God's wonderful acts of salvation and then to follow it with praise and a declaration of faith in him. And then this section finishes off with this wonderful picture of Jethro offering sacrifices to God and eating bread with the elders of Israel in the presence of God, whatever that meant exactly. God's salvation celebrated. Look how far we've come. We get up tomorrow and we'll celebrate it again. And you can start also ticking off promises of God being fulfilled here too in these verses. Back in chapter 9, verse 16, God says Pharaoh had been raised up so that God's power would be shown and so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth tick. Here's Jethro and Midian hearing all about it. Or you go back to chapter 3 verse 12 and the burning bush and God says to Moses, this will be the sign that I've sent you that you shall come back to this mountain and serve me here. Verse 5, where are they? Near the mountain of God. What are they doing at the end of this section? Worshipping him. There's the start of a tick against that promise. God's promise to Abraham, if you want to go way back into Genesis, how he would bless Abraham's family and through him all the families of the earth would be blessed. Here's one of many ticks you see in the Bible against that promise. A priest of Midian, now eating in the presence of God. It all contributes to this sense we have in these verses of look what God has done. Go over the details again and again. Tell yourself the story. Look how he's fulfilled his promises. Look how he's rescued his people who once were foreigners in a foreign land. Then they were helped by God. God's salvation is for God's fame. And God's people don't ever get tired of talking about it and celebrating it and praising God for it. It's what we should be doing ordinarily in our lives and not just talk about it in general terms hooray I'm saved oh Liverpool lost but rehearse the details isn't it amazing what the Bible tells us of Jesus how he's died for me how he is the lamb spoken of so many places in the Bible whose blood pays the price for my sin how I once was in slavery to sin, but now I'm set free. How the enemy who may come chasing after me in his chariots can never pluck me from his hand once I've been saved. He will always be defeated. Go over the story again and again. Go over the details that are specific to your life. How did Jesus make himself known to you? How has it changed your life? Talk about it. Go over it again and again. Look how far we've come. Celebrate salvation. That's a key part of ordinary life, being Christian. It's what we do when we meet together. It's what we do when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. We celebrate everything that God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Stop yourself at some point tomorrow and ask, have I celebrated my salvation today and the next day and the day after that? And just like Jethro here, who had heard it all before, we delight to go over it again. It's like um, we've got our wedding photos in an album that sits at the bottom of the coffee table. And we delight to go over them again. I thought as a man, maybe after so many years, I'd get bored of it, but I don't. I love going over them again. Daisy wasn't even there. She loves going over them again and again. Go over it again and again and again. You shouldn't necessarily be disappointed if you ever leave a church meeting having learned nothing new. But you should be disappointed if you haven't gone over things that are old. And leaving with that 
sense in your heart again of I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me and singing it not just for your own private enjoyment but for the encouragement of your brothers and sisters and also so that as you sing that song out in your life the word goes out that people might hear of it all the wonderful things that the Lord has done as Jethro heard of it and be interested want to find out more someone says no not in this day and age maybe for Jethro then not now people people know it already and they're not bothered well you'd be surprised what people are ignorant of and even if they're not ignorant of what Christianity is about they might be surprised to find people who really believe it and who talk about it and who talk about how their lives have been transformed God's salvation celebrated. It's a key part of what it is to live day to day, ordinarily, as a Christian. Secondly, what we see here, God's people learning God's ways. Seeking to learn those ways, wanting to, knowing that they need to. This is verses 13 to the end of the chapter. Now, yes, this is a good example of somebody listening to good advice. It is a good example of fathers-in-law giving good advice. It is a good example of sharing out work so that one person isn't worn out. But I don't think any of those things are the main thing in these verses. The main thing, I think, is the concern that right down through Israel to every one of God's people, they learn how to order their lives by God's truth and that everyone gets to grow in their understanding of how to live God's way. And not just in general terms, but in all the details of life. And you can see that's what Moses is trying to do before he gets this advice from Jethro. First, he's, he's trying to teach the people God's ways in terms of the general principles. You see at the end of verse 16, it says he's trying to inform them of God's decrees and laws. And then the way that Jethro puts it, uh, when he's speaking in verse 20, that Moses is teaching them the decrees and laws and is to show them the way to live and the duties they are to perform. So there's that, Moses. He's trying to teach everyone the principles of how to live God's way, maybe it's preaching sermons, that kind of thing. But then also, he's trying to answer all their questions and referee in their disputes for the whole of the nation of Israel, where they've understood the principles, perhaps, but they can't work it out in practice. People are disagreeing with each other. And Moses, who's right in this situation? You can see that in verse 16. Now, before we think about Jethro's advice as to how to do that more efficiently, you can appreciate that those are good aims because God's people need to be taught God's ways. And it's worth pausing just there to ask yourself, do you fully accept that? You, you need to be taught how to live God's way. You can't work it out for yourself. You need to come to the Bible and be taught from God's word, every single one of us. And I think it's so easy to forget that and to have a very basic idea of Christianity as though this is what it's about. It's being forgiven for all the wrong things I do. Oh, and I define what wrong is. And it's being uh, given help to live in the right way. And oh, I define what right is. That kind of Christianity doesn't go into the Bible very much. No, you need to be taught God's ways. We are all really like sheep. We really are. And to do our own thing is to go astray and end up who knows where. We really do need to be taught. And it isn't also only about listening to sermons, which is where you get the, the general principles it's also about asking loads of questions about 
all sorts of things. Now, when I was ordained a few years ago, I don't know why this surprised me. It shouldn't have done, really. But I was really surprised when people maybe sometimes came to me and asked me for advice on things, things that are going on in their life. It, it's not like it was happening every day, but it just surprised me the first few times that it happened. Because the thing that I noticed, it, it wasn't often questions about uh, a Bible doctrine or something in the sermon. It was really practical things in people's lives, and they wanted some advice about it. So I was asked things about um, things that were going wrong in the uh, buying of a house and what should the person do. And someone else asked me one time about something about their medical care. And it surprised me at first. And then I thought, that's not a bad thing to do, is it? When you've got something in your life and you're trying to figure it out, go and talk to a friend who reads the Bible and see what they think. And how does it connect uh, to living as God's people? Now, it doesn't have to be with a minister, obviously. It can be another Christian. You know, I have this thing that I'm struggling with. What do you think? How does that tie in with living God's way? And even just ordinary things. I remember in a Bible study years ago in London, someone was really thinking hard, should I spend uh, this kind of money redoing my kitchen? She wanted to know what the Bible study group thought of that. Unfortunately, quite a few of the people in the group thought that was a bit quaint and funny. But it's great. You know, I... I most of us don't even ask that question. I've got the money, I can do the kitchen. She want, is, is this the right thing to do? She wanted to know what we thought. And all of those kind of questions, obviously putting that burden on one person, even in a group this size, would be ridiculous, let alone for the whole of Israel. And this is Jethro's concern. Great that people want to learn how to live God's way, what are you doing, Moses? Verse 18, you're going to get worn out. And so will they if they have to stand in line all day every time they have one of these questions. So this system of sharing the load is proposed and adopted. Moses is still the prophet, verses 19 and 20. He's still to continue to teach them God's laws and how to live maybe through the preaching of sermons and outlining, you know, these are the general principles of what it means to be following God. But then other men are to be appointed who are to be capable for the task, verse 21, and godly in character. And they can deal with everything but the very difficult questions. We do very similar things today as God's people. Those are the kind of qualifications that are outlined in the New Testament for elders. And we have people who take on roles in a church family looking after smaller groups so that every person in a church family gets to grow as they seek to learn what it means to live in God's way in every aspect of their lives. Everything that's going on. If they ask, that is. Something else I noticed when people started asking me various questions, they were all generally older. It may just be that us younger types aren't quite so wise to ask yet. Listen to sermons, understand them, and assume we can apply it in everything else in our lives. seeking to live God's way. So there we are. Ordinary activities of God's people, they look back each day, celebrate their salvation, look how far we've come, delighting to do so, because it is, it is so wonderful to praise God for what he's done, but also so that as we rehearse that wonderful story of salvation, we are part of how the word goes out and others get to hear. And then seeking to learn God's ways in everything. Do you know that's actually a rather wonderful way to live?
Shall we pray now? Thank you, Lord, that we have a wonderful salvation to celebrate in the Lord Jesus as we come to do that now in sharing bread and wine and remembering what you have done for us and how you have brought that home in our lives individually. And thank you that it is wonderful to seek to learn your ways and to live as you've made us to live, as your people. We pray, Lord, that we would never get bored. Never get bored of the wonderful story of our salvation. And never get bored of seeking to live as your people, giving you the glory. Do this work in our hearts each and every day, from now until when we are with you. in the glory that we await. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.